I'll be honest and say that up until a few months ago, I never even heard the word skinwalker before. I only heard it then because I was desperately searching the internet and writing on forums about what happened to me, looking for some explanation, some way of explaining what I saw and finding a logical explanation for it. I'll be honest and say that when I did finally get my answer, it did not comfort me in the least. When Morton got its first proper fast food joint around a year ago, there were some really mixed feelings. The restaurant was out of the way at the entrance to the main town, but off to the left, on a hill that rose up past the largest supermarket complex in town. In other words, it wasn't in the town itself, but in a sort of industrial no-man's land area close to the river. Still for some that was still far too close. Obviously, for some folks in Morton, the character of the place is part of the appeal. And having some American franchise fast food joint close to the entrance to town was an unwelcome addition. For others, it was seen as an outright threat because folks would go there to eat rather than making the trip into the town proper and eating at one of the cafes, pubs, chip shops or restaurants run by local people. For me, it looked like an opportunity. Usually, if someone from Morton wants one of those part-time teenage pocket money jobs, they have to either get a job at the Convy Mart or they would have to travel right into the city by train to work at one of the outlets in the train station there or even further into the city. This new place opening up meant that you could have a fast food job within Morton, and I'm not ashamed to say that the day they put up the posters with an opening date, I was there knocking on the windows with my CV and a big smile hoping to land a job. Sure enough, within a few days I had an interview and got a position working mostly weekends and night shifts. It wasn't exactly fun work, but it paid okay, and I already knew the majority of the other staff members because they were all from Morton. Some, like my mate Danny, even went to the same high school as me in town and sat next to me through five dull years of so-called education. We actually used to laugh that one of the teachers used to say, If you don't study, you'll end up working behind the counter at a fast food joint. Well, look at us now! We used to joke. We sure showed him. Danny was there the night the thing happened. In fact, he wasn't just there, he was there twice. The restaurant closed around 9.30pm. They stay open later in the city, but this being Morton, we weren't exactly going to be getting a lot of custom at that time of night. So we closed everything down, shut off the fryers, changed the oil, cleaned the surfaces and wiped everything over. It was just me and Danny doing the clothes that night and whilst he counted up all the takings, I was out in the seating area cleaning up. Now I should explain that the restaurant had a drive through and was built in such a way that on three sides, the walls at the front of the store were not actually walls, but made entirely of glass. The idea was that people could see folks inside having a good time, I suppose, it's the same way that a lot of fast food restaurants are built and was never a thing that gave me a second thought until I started working night shifts. You see, unlike in the city where the glass will show you everything that surrounds you at night, in Morton, things were different. There is nothing surrounding you. The walls faced out onto a path up from the Convy Mart and on the other side, the river. That meant no lights at night. So, once it went dark, the walls of the restaurant were essentially just huge slabs of black. Transparent walls lead out into the darkness of the bushes and riverbank on one side and the dimly lit path on the other. On the third side, the lights from inside reflected so that the window became like a mirror and you couldn't see outside anyway. On the night that it happened, I was cleaning up and for the first time became acutely aware of this darkness. For some reason, that night, the dark didn't seem to just be there as a backdrop of scenery, but instead seemed to be somehow watching, as if it was pressing with heavy weight against the glass itself and peering in. I remember that every time I turned my back, I felt a strange anxiety, an instinct that told me that turning away was a mistake, as if to take my eyes off the window was dangerous. I remember at that moment listening to see if I could hear Danny in the back room counting change, I wanted to hear him, to know he was there and that I wasn't completely alone with this dark and silence, but no noise came back. Suddenly, the only thing I could hear was my own soft shuffling as I moved around the restaurant, my own shallow breathing, and below that, the rapidly increasing beat of my heart. I looked out into the darkness. I lifted my broom and continued slowly to sweep, still feeling the strange sensation of being observed. I looked out at the darkness again nothing but a wall of silent black, the gentle movement of the bushes, 
and off in the distance the gentle tinkling of the water as the river's dark water flowed lazily by. I moved around a table, bent some napkins, and turned once again to look. This time, though, there was more than darkness. This time, there were eyes. A dog, or at least a thing that looked like a dog, had somehow come out of nowhere. It had materialized as if it had torn itself away from the darkness itself and was sitting upright in the position a dog will take when told to sit and remained perfectly still, not moving a single muscle and staring blankly through the glass. I had heard a story from a friend of mine about a dog named Sarge that lived in these parts and the weird circumstances around it, but this was something different. The dog didn't blink, and I have to say that even then, I knew there was something weird about it because its eyes weren't right. Looking in at me, just beyond the glass, like some exhibit in a zoo, was something seated in the shape of a dog. But it was not a dog. It did not have a dog's eyes. Instead, fixed inside its canine skull, as if someone had removed and replaced what was supposed to be there, were human eyes. Too round, too white, with a blue iris and some horrible flicker of intelligence behind them. They were a person's eyes, stuck into this poor dog's head. Still, it continued to stare, and as it did, I allowed my own eyes to trace the outline of its body. It was then that I noticed the other details, for as I looked toward the ground, my eyes ran along the thing's legs. Now, as I've said, the dog was sitting upright, in the position you would expect if you told a dog to sit. As such, its forelegs and forepaws were in front of it, only, as my eyes ran down those legs, I saw that there were no paws, there were hands. Human fingers, whole hands spread out and clawing at the gravel, like some great fleshy tarantula. Four slender fingers of a milky white colour and a thick, protruding thumb, jutting from the end of a dog's thin legs. A man's hands, but stuck on the end of the dog's legs. I screamed and bolted from the room, shouting for Danny, calling out for him to come so that we could leave together, flee out from that place and onto the road through the emergency exit. I screamed and screamed and Danny called back, not from the back office where I expected him to be, but from outside. He was standing there on the other side of the glass, his face only inches from the glass, unnaturally close, closer than anyone would normally stand. But his breath did not steam the window, because there was no breath. He was wearing his uniform and was staring at me with that same fixed glare that I had seen on the dog. What's wrong, mate? He asked. His voice muffled, muted through the glass. I came out to empty the bins. Let us back in, will you? I swear that for a second, for one awful instant, I was almost relieved and reaching toward the lock, thought about letting him in. As I reached toward the handle, however, I saw something move underneath his face. It's hard to describe, but it was as if something was wearing Danny, as if it was inside his skin. As I watched something beneath his skin, a large, swollen protuberance, like a child's toy car caught beneath a rug, eased along beneath the muscle, as if it was finding the correct spot to stop in. I looked down at Danny's hands. They were long, longer than they ever should have been. The fingers so long that they looked as if they melted from a figure made of wax and threatened to drip onto the floor beneath him. Again, I screamed and reeling back from the glass, tumbled back toward the counter just in time to see Danny, the real Danny, coming round the corner. He saw me in a state of shock and, for just a moment looked past me to the dark outside, to where the other Danny had been standing. Then he turned and ran. We both flew through the emergency exit and were down the hill and halfway home in minutes, never stopping once to look back. The following day, we quit. We would, I think, have been fired anyway for leaving the entire place unattended and uncleaned, leaving the day's takings there on the counter and the emergency exit wide open, but we didn't care. The manager did threaten to prosecute us, saying that we had gone against our contracts and that the money could have gone missing. She said that leaving the place wide open was almost as bad as criminal damage. We told her to watch the CCTV footage from around the building that night. When I asked Danny what he saw when he looked over my shoulder, he said he couldn't be quite sure. The only way he could describe it was that it was a shape somewhere between shapes all misplaced bones and skin that wasn't on right. It was walking or moving in some weird way back toward the path, he said. But it never took its eyes off us. I think it was hungry. Writing those details up on forums, people have come back with the term skinwalker. I don't know much about that. But I do know that the day after we told the manager to watch the footage, she also quit. 
along with seven other staff members whom she told it was too dangerous to work at the site because of a significant threat to health. The store is still there with some new staff, but I still avoid that area like the plague, especially after dark. If I want fast food nowadays, I head into the city 